Hello, everybody. Hello. To, to the Hello. digital. Hello, channel. Tim. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you all. Great to be here. Thank you. Should we start with some introductions? Nah, let's just crack on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know I know all you guys. I don't need to be introduced to any of you. Every, everybody knows us now, don't they? Fair to say everyone's had a busy week by any chance. <laughs> oh my gosh, hasn't it yeah. been? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, so, lead, so lead Eric, away, but Eric who, who did that painting behind your head? Who did that? It's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is this is we just moved house this week. Hi everyone. I'm Eric from Crux, co-founder of Crux, partner of DLA at Night with these guys. Um, so one of my little sideline hobbies is we just moved house this week from a from a, a kind of small apartment uh, that we own and we've rented a house out in the country. And it's been really good because we've managed to get all of the possessions back in from storage and stuff like that. My hobby is creating abstract art. It's a thing that I like to do. And this is a, an original Doyle that my wife said should go in my office. And That's, a so sure. That's, That's a Doyle? That's a Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Doyle. That it's really it's it's really nice. So I, I you are asking about, about the edges, God's man. Asking about should. the corners and the edges. Uh, so I haven't I haven't completed this one. I haven't finished it. Um, this is un unfinished. Um, but if anyone wants to have a little look, just for fun, and don't be critical. Well, you can be critical because I'm I'm very I'm very weirded by this because uh, I've I've done about a hundred pieces, all big pieces, um, and I've never oh, sold man. one. Because the that, value that, that's not true. Because I was at Sotheby's a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> and and I saw there was a bidding frenzy on one of yours, Eric. Well, well, uh, yeah, I don't like to talk about it. I don't like I don't like to talk about that or my charity work. <laughs> but, but but I also re so so the value for this is purely intrinsic. This is like meditation for me. So I realised that this splits the crowd. I remember even showing like some of my best friends. Went onto my Insta Instagram page, which is Huda Funk Pictures. Huda Funk Pictures is the brand, um, and they were like, "Yeah, what does that? What does that all mean?" I don't see any faces or landscapes. It wasn't or like the Hay Wayne or um, no, know, unfortunately, no. That that stuff doesn't. It's the same with music and our. I, I have a bit of an avant-garde perspective, and uh, so yeah, it's been nice to get a hold of things and get things back around and get some pictures that you know it's funny finding the box of pictures and. Yeah, as, as the removal guys were like lifting these pieces of artwork, and you could just see their eyebrows range. Like, do you want to keep this, or does this go to the trash? Because <laughs> <laughs> clearly, your clearly your baby's just been messing about with paint on a on a canvas. You wanna, <laughs> we just take these to the local rub, refuse tip. No, no, they're they're prized pieces of. Oh, right, right, okay, okay. Well, you know, anyway. I I think I got confused for a long time. My my wife was telling me to um, get some original Doyles, but I I heard Doily, <laughs> and uh, I think I got confused. But actually, anyone who anyone who knows anything about abstract art will realize that I that I'm a bit of a rip off merchant because my favorite artist of all time is Gerhard Richter, the German artist, the father of abstract expressionism, who's still alive to this day. One of the only artists of his period who actually realizes the value of his work. It's upside down. Yes, it actually is. It actually is upside down. Um, Gerhard Richter sells pieces for 80, $100 million. And they're, they're larger than that, four times the size of that. But he, he uses a technique. He uses three of the, the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, and two monochrome colors, black and white. And that's all Gerhard and I use. <laughs> so any, any, any colors that appear on the canvas appear through the process. Um, and Gerhard Richter is a brilliant documentary on YouTube. It's really, if you're into art, it's really nice to watch. Um, he is an extremely wealthy, approaching billionaire artist. Now, now in his late 70s, early 80s, but still gets up in the morning, puts on a shirt and tie and a tweed suit, has breakfast with his wife, very methodical, walks out of the studio in uh, his house in Berlin, across the little path to the purpose-built studio, and works from 8 till 5 every day on his works. In his studio, Absolutely. and he's got. If you were selling them for eighty or a hundred million dollars a time, yeah. you would still get up and go you, to work, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Do you, Do you think that perhaps through our our social influence and our large network, we could help Eric uh, sell one of those for eight million, not even eighty? <laughs> eight million Ugandan dollars, which is about forty five pounds. <laughs> uh, Eric, could you um, mention what the the um, uh, uh, the Instagram is again, please. And and could you 
Uh, there's a request that's come in, right? Um, and um, could you do it in a little less Scottish accent? Right, a little less Scottish accent. Yeah, my. Uh, so where where is the person from that said that? Um, they're from the United States. Right, Linwood's, so, um, Linwood's from New Jersey, Eric. Uh, not to different, not to say country. names, but Linwood's my from my New Instagram Jersey. account is Huda Thunk Pictures. <laughs> Huda, all one word. Huda Thunk Pictures, and you'll find uh, you'll find all of my stuff on there. And okay, uh, I think I think the problem is that when you say Huda Thunk Pictures, no one can understand that. Right? Spell it. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> I understand. Right. You. Okay. H double O D A T H U N K. There's a thunk in there. So who'd a thunk and pictures on the end. So all one, all one word, who'd a thunk pictures. And if you're looking for the, uh, the account, it should. Could you stick it in the chat for us? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey, Eric, for, for being <laughs> such a uh, smart sales and marketing guy, that handle is really effing difficult. Exactly. There Deliberately. Deliberately. <laughs> who'd a thunk pictures. There we go. There's there... a lot of people following this. Yeah, there's a lot of people. I'm I'm pretty big in the abstract expression world, you know. <laughs> it's I'm, not I'm just a, you and your mom. I've got 1800, 1800 people. It's mostly mostly other artists. We share each other's share each other's work, but you'll see it's mostly just the the scribble. It, someone said it looks like um, a gorilla has played with its own feces on a canvas. So, <laughs> there's Marky e. Smith. There's Mark. Yeah, the one oh, little really non. Like, uh, I really like that one. Yeah, which which one? Ah, that's a cracker. I love doing hey, that. Eric. One. Eric, you realize with the six of us and our, our collective social influence, you're going to get like five new followers today. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. That's a drop the, drop the mic. <laughs> right there. Uh, that, was, that just caught me perfectly. Oh, another one I like. <laughs> oh, gosh. Up to five new followers. You're going to have to start um, doing a, um, uh, sending them all over to um, New Jersey, I think. Absolutely. Incredible. Oh my goodness, Incredible. I'd love to have a Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, when, I, when I used to work I used to work on uh, the oil rigs and uh, I worked with a lot of guys from the northeast uh, coast of England from Hartlepool and Middlesbrough and all of that and uh, I'd never met these kind of guys before I, I was only 19 when I started working on the on drilling rigs and uh, so I started, I got paired up with this team from Middlesbrough and Hartlepool and all really roughly tufty guys, tattoos, missing teeth, noses over here. And they thought my surname was incredibly funny. Because So if there's anyone listening from the northeast of England, they will know that there's a term, Doylem, which is someone who's who's who makes a lot of mistakes and is a bit unfortunate in life, is a Doylem, which is shortened to a Doyle. So if you are a Doyle in Hartlepool and Middlesbrough, you're an idiot. <laughs> And they love Eric, this. Eric, it's not just it's not just Hartlepool and Middlesbrough. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough about me. No, but, but it's worth saying because you've got you've got young daughters, haven't you, Lemud? Yes, I do. So, so the reason he wants a doyle is that he'll put it on the wall and he'll say to his kids, "Look, if you don't work hard and, and get your exams, this is what you'll end up doing." Exactly. <laughs> oh exactly. My gosh. Yeah, yeah. Without a doubt, if you don't stick in at school, this is what will happen to you. <laughs> so thanks for that guys have a great have a great session i'll catch you later <laughs> no it's great great stuff here great stuff thanks hey i've so learned much. a lot more today than i than i have in our previous uh live so <laughs> see look at when we left when we had it that's it so he, he thinks it's over he's gone he's, he's on to buy one max, he's left max to overload up. of value of your artworks eric that's what he's on to he's on to etsy already he thinks it's our over <laughs> it is now it is now Right, mm. someone bring some semblance of order to this debacle. So what are we going to talk about? Well, we could talk about Facebook. <gasps> Ooh. Yeah. You mean Meta? Meta. Oh, there we go. It's, uh, oh, they're just, they're just trying to be uh, ABC, you know, Google ABC 2.0. They're just trying to, yeah, it's just like Alphabet. Is, is it that or is it a diversionary tactic? You know, there's there's, oh, there's been a number of theorists, yeah, but there've well, been a number it... of whistleblowers, haven't there, that have come out of Facebook over the last month and said Facebook is very <laughs> aware of the uh, of the effect that some of their products have on young people, particularly young women, and uh, and the the mental health issues and anguish that it can cause. 
and uh, and this has been supported by research that Facebook have have done. <laughs> Meta worse. <laughs> um, they've been supported by uh, stuff that Facebook has done in terms of research, which has has subsequently been buried. So this has been uh, a good time for them to do something which has been largely a positive comment. And I don't know about you guys, but you know, I'm I think I'm fairly well clued up on Facebook. But when you see what they do, I mean, in terms of the product portfolio and, and where I had no I had no idea until no. you, you drew our attention to that website. I had no idea they owned Oculus, for instance. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. I, knew, I knew that they uh, they that they they did uh, own that, but, but they've got this this like a Zoom type tablet thing in various different forms that you can buy. And obviously the tie up with Ray Ban with the, the content creator glasses, but the microphone and, and it's all of this stuff that it's almost as if they they've been waiting Google for an opportunity to burst this onto the market so that they can can say to everybody, look over here at this, like a magician, you know, <laughs> misdirecting people. Is it misdirect you know, so if you if you just go by the headlines, and of course we can't believe everything we read in the paper, the headline on the website, connection is evolving and so are we. The metaverse is the next evolution of social connection. Our company's vision is to help bring the metaverse to life. So we're changing our name to reflect our commitment to the future. They couldn't do that with Facebook alone. But this overarching holding company that's going to be into all types. So here's my thing. I know everyone doesn't, like, not everyone's going to agree, but I think, I think I'm not a huge Zuckerberg fan. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I like I like it when there's, there's for some reason there's loads on TikTok today working on the on the conspiracy that he is actually a synth and he's not human. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and some of them are really, really funny on TikTok today. Really funny. Um, but uh, I I think I think every organisation, if if they are if there's any truth behind this should be given the ability to change direction and maybe apologize for behavior in the past and move forward. I don't know. I don't know enough about it, to be quite honest, to, to give a, a really have, balanced have, view. Have they apologized, though? That's the point. Probably yeah, no, not. not at all. Prob no. Probably not, and probably never will. But I think everyone everyone should be given the chance to evolve and change direction. Uh, yeah. and, and I think there's a there's a far bigger thing going on um, in terms of... of, of <laughs> um, you know, I, we were going to talk about this before, and I wrote six things down, and I didn't mention e any of them. Um, and I think there's far bigger things, way above our pay grades, going on in the world, which yeah. you know, like you know, you know, there's an artificial intelligence war going on between China and and and, and America, and mm -hmm. Russia and 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 the UK, and and we're losing it because we don't have the we don't have the right. Um, you know, if you look at the way I've got, I'm, I'm doing a presentation on um, on social media in China coming up in in two or three weeks' time, and um, you know the way that the Chinese go about it is very different. But in China, there's no privacy at all, mm. um, because if you if you um, they've actually structured and that the, the way that they've built their social media is based around a credit card rather than based around advertising. Mm. Um, and and so what you're seeing is that you're 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 there's 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 these what what's happened is that the life has moved into digital, and then what we have are basically these competing factions going on, and and so there's things going on way above above our pay grade against you know what's going on in Facebook and and uh, WeChat and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, but I think at the end of the day, what it's really coming down to, at least in the immediate future with respect to meta, is uh, virtual reality uh, and yeah. the introduction and, and the spread of 5G and the ability to actually have enough bandwidth to support uh, a virtual reality world. And, and that's really what Metaverse is, is all about. And, and that is going to have an incredible <laughs> impact on social media. And that's worth discussing. Yeah, yeah, and, and 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 you know the way that I see things going is that you're going to be able to have you know I'm, I've got a as you 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 guys know I run a podcast we're going to have an episode of that on the 15th of November in the metaverse I'm not going to be in the metaverse because I've got a, um, the goggles and stuff but the person I'm interviewing is going to be in the metaverse um, so this person um, has bought land in the metaverse they've built art galleries. In, in, they have two art galleries in the metaverse and they've bought NFTs, which they've basically put in the art galleries. 
And what we're going to do is I'm going to talk to him about the metaverse, what it is, and, and the opportunity for people. Remember, this is still quite early days. Mm-hmm. Is it though? Um, I, mean, I mean, people were buying property and putting NFT type materials into Second Life 10 years ago. Absolutely. In Second Life, is, it's, it kind of seems to be no different from Second Life in terms, mm-hmm. of, in terms of the way that it's, it's, it's built and structured. But, but um, there's, there's that extra degree of, of textural realism to it now because yes yeah, so so you should be so you know when 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 everyone said hey everybody um you can now have um video on linkedin and you can now have video calls on linkedin what i thought what had been developed what i was excited about was the fact that someone could actually connect to you on linkedin and you could have a meeting with them in their office in melbourne in australia from london so 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 what the metaverse does, it makes Zoom redundant. Mm-hmm. Because what we'll be able to do is better put our goggles on and actually walk into the office or walk into the home if, if people will allow that. It, it may make and Zoom have that redundant. Meeting. Will, Sorry? Will, it, will it make travel redundant? As well, well? It, 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 I mean, because of, the, because of the COVID situation and the adoption of the big working from home experiment and the fact now that we're... Far, people are far more happy about sitting from home and actually doing work than they were probably two years ago. Yes, I think it will do. And we'll, you can put on a pair of goggles and start having meetings with people across mm. the other side of the world. And 5G, Eric, as you mentioned, it allows us, you know, the bandwidth allows us to do that. Yeah, and that's, exciting. sorry, I find that exciting. Yeah, me too. A very exciting, very exciting. It's also extremely interesting when you look at the biggest social media platforms and we're China, because we don't get we don't get the visibility that the that, that, uh, to see what they're doing with it. But starting falling down that rabbit hole of social media in China and what's actually happening within social structures and social media in China is incredible, right? Absolutely yeah, incredible. So, yeah, so, so you know, you, you um, you've been able to bulk. You've been able to have um, Uber. There was Uber functionality. So Uber is a copy of WeChat. I know yeah. that everybody puts it, puts it up and says, isn't this amazing innovation? It was in WeChat five years before Uber started it. You yeah. could book mm-hmm. a taxi in, in uh, WeChat five years before Uber started. It's now like, I mean, the Chinese were like, duh, why couldn't we do that? <laughs> uh, and, 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 the thing, and, 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 and the whole of WeChat is in effect, as you'll probably, you know, there's a wall garden. It is, a, it is the whole of the internet within that. So I've done a, a, I've done a, a podcast with a guy who used to work at Reuters. Um, and he, the, the Reuters WeChat website gets more hits than the Reuters website in, in China because it's so advanced. That's if you want to approach a website, you approach it, it through WeChat. And and the way and you some of you are gonna gonna cringe at this because because of the way that the privacy has changed. In in China, there is no privacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is AI in WeChat that will actually, if you meet certain friends every Friday, it will actually um, if you do it twice, what it will do is the AI will actually say, do you want to meet with your friends and shall we book the table at the same place you want to go to? Yeah. Yeah. Now, now I would find that really useful. A lot of people would be screaming privacy. I don't, I'm not, I, I don't, I don't want that. But, but the, 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 the issue is, is that if we are going to advance as a society and be the most technically advanced <laughs> Um, society and retain our position in in the world as being the number one innovationary um, uh, uh, set of countries. That's the position that we need to have. We don't have it. Nowhere near it. So nowhere near it. We nowhere near it. And 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 it depends on it depends on you know it doesn't really matter who's innovating more or who's innovating faster because there's certain things where people make announcements and you go well why would you do that that's just put you back two years and etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's 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 but there is such a difference between the two social networks that we have and we have people screaming for about privacy and we have other people that are overtaking us in their ability to innovate because we're so behind in the way that the social network is set up. 
And all I'm doing is I'm putting together a different position than what you're hearing about and about privacy. As far as I'm concerned, Facebook, I would I would like Facebook and Google to know more about me because they can actually then take the heavy listing. I don't want to think about certain things. I, I, there's certain shit on my desk that I would like to remove into Facebook and, and Google. And it doesn't allow me to do that because the privacy for me is too tight. I would like it far more looser and I would prefer to give them things to do. And I can't do that. That's an alternative view for you guys and the way mm. that people think. I'll say. Mm -hmm. I'll say I'm not sure I would be on 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 the same page with with, with all. No, with I'm, all and I'm not them, saying but... I'm not asking for you to agree. What I'm doing is I'm putting forward my view of you know what's my what's view the world, to... my understanding of social media, and the way that I sure. want to run my life. Yeah, you know, I would yeah, love. Yeah. I've argued before. I would love it if um, I used to put. I used to put reviews of films into Google because I actually hoped at one point it would say, you need to watch this film because you've reviewed all these other films. And I stopped doing it because of the fact they didn't do it. I still had to go through. I still have to go through the painful process of reading reviews in the paper to see what or listening to my friends to say, what should I go and see Dune or not? But what 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 an algorithm should do is actually give me the ability to actually say, do you know that there's films coming out? I think based on the other films that you've watched, you should actually you should watch it. But I can't because of the privacy settings here in the in in the Western world don't allow that to happen. So so there are some brilliant um, there are some brilliant. I won't, we won't put any links in the chat, but there are if you've never done it before, looking into social media in in China and what's going on, and some of the things that that yeah, as as Tim says, because there is no privacy, because it is wide open. So there there's the there's the 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 dichotomy unfolding in front of us, the yeah. the, the, the opportunity and dichotomy, right? So we are tightly bound. They're not in terms of privacy, but look what they've got. Um, uh, Pinduo Duo springs to mind. Pinduo Duo is one of the most interesting. I, I did a, an article about this uh, uh, about a year and a half ago. I was so taken aback by what they were doing. In just three years, Pinduo Duo, Duo became so successful that they were able to initiate their own public offering on the NASDAQ um, from a standing start to three years to IPO on NASDAQ, an incredibly successful organization based on the fact that they gather lots of data about you for shopping. This is about e-shopping. So... Adam looks at this, and he's got a network of followers on Pinduo Duo. Adam buys this, and before he buys it, it says, listen, if you recommend this to six of your friends and six of them buy it, we'll give you a discount. We'll give you a massive discount. So it's group shopping and discount by group shopping, but it's gathering data on what we all like and what we don't like, gathering stacks so that when Adam wakes up in the morning, there's a whole stuff on Pinduo Duo that he's probably going to want to buy. And of it's course, all guitars. You, it's all guitars. All, all guitars. All guitars and that specialist stuff that you buy from that specialist shop, which we won't talk about. Um, <laughs> I mean, plectrums. Of course. <laughs> plectrums. Plectri. Um, <laughs> and uh, and that, that whole thing. So it's like Amazon and every other different shopping channel all squished into one, gathering billions and billions and billions of little slices of data and offering up you massive life discounts. If you can influence your followership, to make purchases on your behalf. So they get discounts and you get discounts and it's all growing and building. The the, the sellers are winning because they're selling lots of stuff and you're winning because you're saving money on the stuff that you want to buy. Um, but it all it's sucking so much data and so much information, but it's exactly what Tim says. They wake up in the morning and it's it's basically all presented. There's your day presented for you. So I'll tell, tell, you, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story. Um, my, Tell us a story. My, my partner and I, we went to the Google Glass launch in um, um, in um, in London, and um, we got we we actually it was suggested that we leave. <laughs> so um, um, so we we put these we um, Julie and I we, were, we you know we put these Google glasses on, and um, and we looked at each other and went they're shit aren't they? And we went yeah. They're, they're, we looked at it. I went there, and I mean the computer in them. And as you can imagine, that the computer is, is so small. I mean, it's like a um, like a Sinclair like a PC or something like that. Like, like a PC. It, it's 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 smaller than that. It's smaller than a PC. So we put these Google glasses on, and it's like. And what you can do is you can upload these 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 apps, and the apps were like because you know even then. The iPhone, it was probably the five or four or five or something. You know, it was you could do something. Like there was a 
the night sky um there's a there's an app you can get with the iphone when it ch- set, tells you what the um the stars are where you where my you girls set. love it yep. yeah and um so we put these so th- th- so they said and here's the one with the stars on so we're going like this and julie said to me can you see uranus <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I used to love, but I've lost a bit of flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> if I stretch a little, me, I'm not being I couldn't, with the I couldn't stop laughing because <laughs> everyone else is being really. Oh wow, these aren't these are really good. And she goes to me, "Can you see Uranus?" <laughs> and I couldn't stop laughing. Anyway, um, we decided to, to to have some photos. There's there's there's, there's actually um, one up there somewhere. of us wearing Google glasses. And, then I thought we decided to leave. I thought I you thought... were asked to leave because you didn't arrive on a skateboard and you actually had a belt on your jeans. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> you were messing but, up the but, average age of the But the, the event. opportunity, the, oppo- the business opportunity for Metaverse mm-hmm. and for some sort of goggles or glasses and having super Zoom, you know, Zoom meetings on steroids is just massive. Mm. But, you know, bring it, bring it home, maybe. Um, if you can't get somebody to write content on LinkedIn, how, how big a jump is it to get them to jump with business on virtual reality, do you think? There's a point. There's a point right there. So at the end, at the end of the day, um, all the technology that's coming and that we're talking about and that is very powerful and, and has major implications. What does it do for B2B today and how can B2B stay on top of all that? And what do we as a group and a team recommend them to stay on top of in, in light of that with respect to what they want to do with their businesses? Yeah, that's a great point, Thomas. And and the what I just I just want to make say one thing quickly, which is that as far out as the metaverse is, there's no way to make a, that big leap. You've got to even these incremental changes are big changes, but you really do need to make this to make the move right to just being social. <laughs> it's, how about we try being social with what we have well, today? Do, do, you, <laughs> do, do so. you? So, so when you go to an ex, so so why don't you go to an exhibition? Because you've got to travel there, which takes you an hour and a half. You've got to park, which costs you fifty dollars. Uh, you walk around the exhibition, nine tenths of which is utter garbage that you have no interest in. When you find the thing that you do want to view. Uh, why don't you go on the stand? You know why you don't go on the stand because the sales sales from... exactly they're they're like vultures. They're on you with their claws and they won't let you go. So now with the metaverse, you can go. There's no travel time. You can go to the event. You can go to just the stands you want. There are no salespeople there. You can walk around and look at the presentations if you're interested, and then you can leave when you're ready. Actually, that's that's pretty. You know what? Better. My my wife's. Do you guys know what my wife's favorite thing is about Maui, Hawaii? Oh, you the beautiful beach. Beautiful Besides beach. me you with her uh, on the beach. Yeah, no, it's the it's smell the of cigar smell. smoke. It's the smell when we get off the airplane because their their planes land and you walk outside, and it's the smell of Hawaii when we get off the plane. Uh, yeah. But what does it smell of? Freedom Salt. and rela- relaxation. Yeah, nature. <clears throat> so, so, you know, so that, you, that's fine. You get a, a you get a pina colada handed to you. You get <laughs> you get you get a flower people. you get a flower lay thrown over your over your. I thought that was uh, Florida. Head. Oh no, Florida! They uh, they give you a, a forty ounce cheap beer and punch you in the face. So, so what's the so, so, so what's the lovely smell that assails your nostrils when you get out of the subway at Madison Square Garden to go to an event? <laughs> oh, it's not, no, it's not the, the same urine. smell. It's not, it's <laughs> not the same <laughs> that's for sure. It's the, it's the hot dog. <laughs> Methamphetamine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my yeah. goodness. But, 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 so, so I've put interest, a name. Interest, interest, sorry, carry, carry on. I've put a name. I've, I've put a company in the chat. Uh, and they're doing we are. Um, like meta. I've got an interview with the CEO of that. They they do like metaverse conferences. So, so my 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 point is, and, and I think you're absolutely right, Thomas. You know, the challenge is is getting people to be social. But how do you get people to use uh, to to create content for LinkedIn? And, <laughs> and Sorry, how does Robert. that translate into into what happens in the metaverse? 
I think the interesting thing is that mm. people are going to need guides, aren't they? You know, like yes. all of these things, uh, you know, our raison d'etre is to guide people on how to use what is effectively a 15 plus year old piece of technology. Mm -hmm. and you would think that by now, what you need to do to be effective in the modern world on social networks is pretty obvious, really. You've got to be yourself. You've got to be active. You've got to build a big network of people that actually want to listen to you when you speak. It's, it's not rocket science, any of this stuff, and yet people don't get it. And now people are going to segue seamlessly from, like Tim said, you know, from we're going to have a messaging exchange in LinkedIn Messenger, and then all of a sudden it's going to be, actually, do you want to meet quickly? I've got 10 minutes now, and then we're going to be in the same room. Maybe maybe it will be the, the metaverse beach on Hawaii. Should we meet in Hawaii? Yeah, why not? But, with a, with a know, scratch and sniff card. What people, was want, what people don't want is to, to make a mistake, isn't it? You know, what they want is to, to have somebody that will handhold them through that process. So they go, actually, this is not so scary after all. And this creates a, a whole world of opportunities for everybody, doesn't it? Just, have you seen a little, any here's a little gurus on LinkedIn yet? There's a joke. So, Sorry. A joke. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I think I think we're missing a point here. I think we're missing a point. I think we're talking about how, how we, how we, how we in the metaverse, we in the metaverse. Here we go. Right. Here we go. I don't think the metaverse is for us at all. So as it stands right now, back in the old days with sales, it was all about how many people can we get out conversing with other people, right? And progression and marketing failing and sales becoming more difficult and all of that, cold calling falling away, emailing falling away, advertising becoming despised is an evolution, right? So now we, now we, we know that social helps companies improve their position, but we're still limited by how many people that we can get interfacing with people. When we are putting bots into social, the humans don't like it. But bot to bot is a different story, a completely different story. So bot to human isn't liked. We don't like that. We all repel, you know, when, oh, that's a bloody bot talking to me and trying to have a relationship with me. But bot to bot, I think many, many years down the line, I don't think this is next year. It might be 10 years from now that companies will have virtual reality, AI, not sales teams, but the whole presence will be virtual reality, robot, robot to robot, not people at all. Not people at all. The whole thing will know. be done. The next evolution is going to be electronic to electronic. There you go. People, it will be, but it'll be avatar, avatar, avatar will be the new avatar, 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 avatar to avatar. There you go. Yeah. What I th where, I thought you were going, where I thought you were going with that, yes. Eric, is actually the generational differences. That really it's the leaders in the, the younger people in organizations, millennials and Gen Z, they're ready for social. They're ready to do it. They're the ones that are calling for what can we stop dialing the phone or whatever. They don't even know they're doing it. They're but but it's. It. But, but you know, and so where I thought you were going with that is that the metaverse is actually for a generation yet unborn, right? And I, the reason why I say that is because I actually read some statistics, which I saved but didn't know I would need today, about how Facebook as an application is trending much older and the younger people don't, they're not on Facebook, they're on some other. So, you know, in my mind, you know, I'm thinking Zuckerberg is thinking, listen, this Facebook thing has got a limited shelf life because I can't get uh, Gen X or not Gen X, Gen Z on, on Facebook. So I got to start thinking about, you know, the people who are yet unborn and how I'm going to get those people, you know. Um, so anyway, that's where I thought you were going with it. And I think there's some some truth to that, that what's holding social back and businesses from really evolving is the leadership is so antiquated in their thinking. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but anyway. I, th I, 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 I firmly believe that we will eventually become the weak link. The saggy bags of bones and jelly and, and all of that will become the weak link. And it will become the position where, as, as Thomas rightly pointed out, avatar to avatar. But the avatar doesn't need to see another avatar to see whether it's going to build a relationship with it. It'll all be just done silently and electronically. The matrix will come to life. <laughs> but, but, yeah. you're, talking, you're talking about a, a Terminator kind of reality where 
pe people are extraneous to the business that goes on between the Borg. Yeah, yeah but you know, what, as, it, as interesting as all that is, I just want to get more sales next month. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you do? Do you beat, beat the machine with the bot in to make more calls? No, the machine the, the machine has to make a sale and then ring the bell, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this arm comes out and rings the bell. <laughs> let, me, let me back in, Hal. I can't do that, Dave. <laughs> I can't do that. You've not made because you haven't calls. made your quota yet. You haven't made enough calls. <laughs> Let me in from the cold. I'm freezing out. I, I, I hear. You, I hear in our future. Made enough calls, Dave. I, I hear I about, sometime about, about in our future. Dave. I hear in our future. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. I. Uh, I. Um, is it okay to to slightly jump off on a tangent? Yeah, or maybe yeah. maybe take it back to home base because I know Thomas is itching too. He's fed up with this conversation. Um, <laughs> Thomas, I, Thomas, Thomas was scratching. Thomas mission. <laughs> um, I read a, a lovely little article in uh, in uh, Marketing Profs a couple of days ago um, uh, by Melissa Sargent, um, CEO of Litmus. And although we've, we've spoken about it before, it was nice to see it sort of uh, repackaged and sort of... Uh, uh, reframed a little bit, but, you know, Litmus, big into digital marketing and all of that. And Melissa's article was all about the fact that, um, you know, it's a, it's a nice perspective. And I thought there was something in it. It was three reasons why B2B marketers really need to take the leads from their B2C counterparts and really need to tune into what they're doing. And she gave us three, three main headlines um, uh, under the banner of, uh, even though B2C and B2B sell you know, sell differently and have different product sets, B2B brands can still in, implement B2B marketing strategies to increase increase their return on investment. Uh, homing in on things like personalization are three things where increased personalization, right? We've known that for a long time. She talks about buyers now expecting personal connections in the way that B2C world was expecting personal connections all the time. And that level of customer service and relationship, she's absolutely homing in on the fact that buyers now in the B2B world, they're expecting that personal yeah. uh, personal relationship and also that brand experience. She also talked about multiplying digital touch points, which I thought was pretty cool, which B2C are quite good at. You know, we'll mm. meet, we come, we sometimes come across B2B people. I was, I was working with a drinks uh, manufacturer recently and when we were listening to their B2C element, they've got a big B2B part. Their B2C element is all over. They spoke about their Instagram strategy, their Facebook strategy, their TikTok strategy, Snapchat. They're, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. What do you do in B2C? Oh, I put some stuff in LinkedIn. B2B. B2B. Yeah. B2B. B2B. Yeah, B2B. So they've got this massive B2C, you know, their Instagram team and their Facebook team. What do you do on B2B world? Yeah, we've got, um, you know, Sarah over there. She sticks some stuff up on LinkedIn on a Thursday. Right, okay, wow. Um, okay, so, uh, and then the last bit was relevant content. So really homing in on the fact that um, B2B brands don't have the um, don't have the mindset yet to understand that their content is defining them and it's leaving that breadcrumb trail about who they are and what they are because they haven't honed in on the, on the personalization and also the digital touch points. So I thought it was a nice little article. It's by Melissa Sargent. It's in Marketing Cross. Three things B2B marketers can learn from B2C marketing strategies. And I thought it was a nice overarching little piece. Who, who wrote that, Eric? Mel Melissa Sargent, the CEO of Litmus. Okay, thank you. And it brings up a really good point, um, and that is that uh, the leadership um, of B2C and, and the retail worlds are far ahead in many ways with respect to leadership and B2B. Uh, whether it be manufacturing, whether it be distribution, whether it be technology, any of those groups, far and far, far away ahead. Oh my and, that, and that's the difference. And you, you put that it's, uh, you put that right on the button, Eric. And, and, and until they get with it, the rest won't happen. Big time. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good point. And I, I think that, um, I mean, we've always seen leadership as being, being have, have struggled understanding what social is. Um, certainly in the B2B, B2C world here in, in, in Europe, they're far more ahead in terms of adoption. I mean, if you think about people's TikTok strategy, it's actually taken a long time for people to come up with one, but they still do have one. The same with um, um, Clubhouse. Do you remember that? Um, 
uh, the, uh, you know, or Twitter spaces, um, you know, it's, it's taken a little while for people to, to come up with something. You always have to have people innovating, but, you know, B2C. So, so why is that? Why is it that B2B is so far behind in terms of adopting new ideas and going to new places to meet their prospects and customers. Oh, you're just you're just setting them up, aren't you? You're just setting yeah, them up. It, it's just I appreciate I appreciate that. But you know, it this is this is the conversation that we need to be having to it help, absolutely is to help company to come alongside them and help them. And it's I mean we could just start listing things off, right? Corporate culture. Get your shit done and every 30 days hit your mark. There's no room in there to test or to try or break away from the existing playbook or, or to get it wrong. Well, right. Yeah, exactly. There's no room for always... failure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I, instead of listing them all off, we, I don't know, maybe we should list them off for people that are, are listening because um, there was a, there was a very good, there was a very good uh, LinkedIn live webinar on this yesterday with a small group of people. Oh, yeah. Very... <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw something about that. It was very popular, yeah. wasn't it? It was very, very good. It, hit, it just speaks directly to this very subject. <laughs> the, the, I mean, what list them off, Brandon? Because there may be people listening that that, that that don't understand, you know, the differences. You know, a lot of people, as you know, who worked in B two B, for for if you if you're in leadership in B two B, you've been in B two B for twenty years, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, senior leadership, you know, SVP type level. Um, you probably don't have never worked in B2C. So don't yeah. necessarily see the difference. And a lot of people will say that B2B, and I'm not, I, this is a sweeping, sweeping generalization. A lot of people think that, that B2B is boring. I actually think it's, you know, stuff like this is actually, is, is, is actually really interesting. It's but, electric. But, but uh, thank you. But a lot of people actually see it as, as, as being boring and therefore they don't do stuff. Um, I, yeah. I just saw this coming from from um, Jamie. Um, it's hard because we grow with failure, but there's no room. Yeah. I, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I know I've worked in in organisations where you really had to push out to say we're going to do something and it may fail, and yeah. you kind of like we're having to kind of support it like Hercules. Um, yeah. And then because there's a, there was a massive blame culture, you know, things went wrong. Who are we going to blame? I've got yeah. my finger up. Who's we, who we going to blame? Well, can, and can if you're looking for a job, you looked for you looked for entrepreneurial. That was the that was well, at least when when I was entering the work world, we I looked for organizations that said they were entrepreneurial because those or, that was their way of saying you know we're willing to take a few more risks than some traditional organizations. Or it was just a word they used mostly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think Most that's the thing, that. isn't it? Ken, Ken Robinson said that uh, there's no there's no opportunity to be creative in what you do if you're not prepared to be wrong. He said, you know, the caveat to that is that he's not saying that being wrong and being creative are the same thing, but you know we have big challenges that need to be overcome and the only way that we can overcome them is by acknowledging that we're going to go down some dead dead ends and some some yeah. you know and, and be prepared to 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 well uh, move quickly and break things mm -hmm. i think it's the face hey, i haven't it? i haven't paid attention go ahead tim so i was actually going to talk about you 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 you, <laughs> you said something yesterday on the the webinar that we ran that adam's kindly put the link in the in the chat which is that that I, I mentioned about people not being afraid about getting outside mm -hmm. help, right? And you told a story about when you moved from California to where you are now, you rented a house. Right. You didn't buy a house because actually right. you didn't know where to, you wanted to live. Yeah, you thought, well, yeah. it's, it's kind of here, so we're going to live here, and then we'll drive out and we'll kind of find the best places, and then we'll find somewhere to right. um, to live. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean. Uh, if if I was a B two B sales leader or C suite right now, I would look at you know any of the six of us on here and say, what would it take to rent them for a year in my business to mm -hmm. completely digitally around social transform the way we communicate with all the people that we need to communicate and influence, whether it's in your sales, it's your HR, it's your marketing, it's it's even using social as a communication tool for your 
for your internal team. Um, you know, look at something like that, like rent people. But here, here's the other thing I was going to say, and, and thank you for that, Tim, is, um, and I think I said this yesterday, in the kind of entrepreneurial um, expert uh, space, which you guys know I've been an entrepreneur and I've got all the bruises to show it. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a culture of failure is good because it's, it means you're trying, you're pushing, you're innovating, you're, you're, you're trying to learn new ways of doing things. And there is a concept of fail fast, but there is a big acceptance of failure because the value it brings and it's just not at all accepted in corporate America. There's just a complete different shift. But this is the reason why small, nimble startups are actually kicking ass right now over the big players that should be doing this. And, and it's, it really just comes down to that. And, you know, I had in, in one of my companies we, where we got to a size that this was important was I had a team internally that we called the innovators and they had a budget and they had a vision to go try new stuff. And then we had the rest of the team was the maintainers and they maintained everything that we were doing, but there was a, a marriage at some point when something was proven in a little microcosm over here and it worked up, it worked well and we could see a, a vision for it. Then we moved it in to the, you know, to the rest of the business and it helped us grow. We grew wide and we grew deep with our customers because we do that. And I heard rumblings five years ago about companies creating these entrepreneurial hubs within their large corporations. And I heard rumblings and I honestly, I got excited because I'm like, man, those guys got a lot. I mean, they've got big budgets. They have existing clients ready to go. I mean, what an amazing startup world. And for somebody like me, I was drooling at the thought of doing this and was even considering going, I'd go work for one of these big companies if I had that type of environment. And I just don't hear about it anymore. Like it just, what, I mean, well, you know what I'm happens, just not You know what happens? Because yeah. I've worked for organizations where there's a, there's a famous bank. There's one of the um, banks here that has a constant flow of things. And what happens is that they, the bank said, we've created a separate team um, they're going to be entrepreneurial and they're the bank of the future, right? So everybody else in the bank looks at them and go, you're the competition. We're going to do everything to kill you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so everything that they come up with, the rest of the bank basically stops and kills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that they, and they know that the persons that they've, they, they, they recruit somebody every 18 months as a, you, I get contacted. Would you be interested in running? No, I'm not. Cause it, it will be 18 months and you'll be looking for someone to replace me every 18 months. The person has it, it because it just doesn't work. And that, and, and that's the, and that's one of the, <laughs> the, the real issues that, 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 Corporate corporate organisations have with change, and especially the change if if by creating separate organisations as a way of helping to get that. Yeah, and, and I think so, Jamie spoke to it as well, and and and, and I would just add to that: uh, current organisational structures, especially B two B, have not changed in I don't know what sixty seventy years, uh, and and they need to be slightly adjusted to better suit uh, today's reality. Um, you know, and, and, and I don't mean this in, in a negative, but all these tiers and levels, they gotta go. Uh, it doesn't work. It, it's not feeding the organism what it needs in reference to everything that we're talking yeah, well, about what, today. What else, what else hasn't changed in 70 years? Nothing. Everything else has transformed out of all recognition, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that hasn't, and and Max that teams. in large part is the reason is is part of the reason. I'm sorry, Tim. Go ahead. I just said faxes. I was just picking off some things that have changed. Technology that's kind of changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, it, you, the idea that Brandon's talking about at the entrepreneurial level, at the venture capital level, at the people that are really making things happen. These are small groups of people. They are not in large organizations. They are not restrained. They are not afraid of failing because they know they have to fail. And that's a whole different thinking that needs to come into the into the corporate world. But you can't do that, as Tim so rightly put, in the existing structure because the existing structure will kill you. It's that simple. 
All right. Uh, so, it, you know, what you what you touched on there, Thomas, that I think we need to highlight and you're spot on is the venture capital model actually is foundational on exactly what you just said. They invest in 10 companies knowing nine of them are going to fail, but one of them right. is going to knock it out of the park and it's going to, you know, 20 X or whatever it may be their money and make up for the nine failures. They accept failure as part of their foundational strategy. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and companies need to, to, to take on that thinking, but also leverage technology that they're not comfortable with, that they're not familiar with in ways that allow them to do that. And to move forward, and some things are going to work, and some things aren't. Right? <laughs> That's just the, the 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 nature of the beast. But you have to you have to get just as involved in that technology and that shift as you expect your people to. Right? You have to walk the walk. You can't just talk the talk. And that's the difference. Those are the companies that you see win, are when their leadership actually gets right in there, rolls up their sleeves, levels the playing field, and and works with the team to do it. That's those are the ones that win. Is there any other things that people can share about what they're seeing in customers at the moment around what's working in terms of transformation and the and the things and the learnings that we could share with the audience in terms of uh, what's what's working and what's not working? Well, I mean, I talk about it all the time, and we're talking about it now. It's uh, really focusing on your people, focusing on um, and less on the technology. And I think that's very well documented now that um, organizations that are primarily focused on the technology um, are not doing as well as you mean just the, buying a tool and, and yeah, just buying a tool and the yeah. tool is going to solve the problem. That, a fool with a tool, and all that. <laughs> it's still a fool, right? So. Um, so what we're starting to see now is, especially um, in the major, the big consulting firms are starting to talk about this a lot more. It's it's a people first digital transformation, focusing on changing behaviors in uh, the people so that the culture of the organization fits with where the organization wants to go. So there are certain organizational behaviors, certain personal behaviors, leadership behaviors, which Thomas is talking about, that support innovation. Um, and, um, and, you know, that's come out of research, a lot of research done by some folks from Deloitte and Harvard on um, the innovative companies, even the in a very large innovative companies, you know, Google, Amazon, they attempt at least to maintain certain organizational and, and personal structure of leadership behaviors so that they um, so that they can win. One, which I was surprised to find out as I've been researching and um, working in this area now for five years is coaching. The amount of coaching going on in startups was is was a big surprise to me. Um, you know, I came out of why the, was it a surprise? Because I just didn't know there, there's not a lot of coaching, at least in my experience, in professional services. I saw almost no coaching. Wait, but you said professional services versus startups. I mean, right. What? So what? That's I'm a I'm, startup you guy. Asked, you Could... asked me why was there a surprise, and so I'm saying is I came yeah. out of professional services. Right there, you uh, go. Moved into corporate America, working for um, a two billion dollar organization that did not focus on talent development or coaching at all. Yeah. And then I go That's and I fair. find out that the leadership teams of Google, Facebook, um, into it, they they all had a they all had a coach. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and what's really interesting is that that so Tim and I came from a big corporate, and any coaching took the form of mentoring, where somebody would it would be completely ad hoc. It would be like, okay, I'm going to help you because I'm. I'm a woman and you're a woman or I come from this country and you come from, you know, it's been so very much like I will take you under my wing and coach you. But increasingly, as we talk to other organizations that are in that kind of space, you know, maybe a large tech company with 30, 40, 50 billion dollars a year turnover. And we get to know senior people. All of the coaching and mentoring is stuff which is done as a favor there's no formal structure. Mm. There's no encouragement given. There's no training people. on how no. to do it well. No. So it's like, I really like you, Brandon. You know, can you help me? And you go, yeah, I don't mind mentoring you on an ongoing basis. And it's really interesting that that 
organizations that rely so heavily on talent often put so little into developing that talent. Yeah, it's 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 really remarkable. But um, but there's a great book. It's um, it's called Trillion Dollar Coach. Oh, yeah, I read that. Yeah, great. That's a great book, right? And it talks it's about this, book. this this coach that came out of I forget his name now. He came out of professional, uh, not uh, college sports. Yep. Okay, and he coached uh, the teams at eBay, Google, Google, State Jobs. Facebook. Yeah, same guy. Uh, so, um, a you know that's worth taking note. Yeah, it's good. Cool. Yeah. Good book. Really, good and book. I would. And I would say I value the most in my career, the fact that I chose not to do an MBA, but I did a master's in organizational development with an emphasis around coaching and organizational culture, primarily because even back then when I was young, dumb and well, young and dumber, um, I knew that the answer was always going to be the people. And I still believe that culture will eat strategy for lunch. Well, you know, it's interesting when you look at professional sports, when you have to you, you have to work as a team to be successful, there is a coach. There is a professional coach that works mm -hmm. with that team. OK, so that I mean, it would be we would think oh, very strange if, you know, an NFL team said we're not going to have a coach. We're just going to let the players go out there and figure it out. <laughs> you know yeah right that that would seem like crazy so now we see and that that's what was so like i'm refreshing exciting to read this book um trillion dollar coach and find out that these you know cheryl sam carol sam what's her name cheryl, cheryl, cheryl Sandberg and, Sandberg, and yeah. zuckerberg like they had a coach to help their senior leadership work mm -hmm. as a team to resolve problems to um you know they i mean that's i don't i don't i don't know i haven't seen that in corporate america so to find out that these very successful organizations these um startups um and i think in like you said brandon in startup culture you know uh, there is a, a lot more culture coaching um in part because collaborating as a team is one of those organizational behaviors that supports innovation that you really don't see in corporate America. You know, and, it, and it's, it, and it's also out of necessity, right? Because yeah. you don't have, you don't have all of the perks and bells and whistles that you can offer that, that enterprise organizations can. And so, that it, you know, small innovative companies also look for innovative ways to serve their people and create culture. Which is, hey, we may you may not have the end of the year trips here, there, or wherever yet, but what we're going to do is we're going to pour into you, we're going to coach you, we're going to you're going to have a mentor or not a mentor, you're going to have a coach, not somebody that and, and somebody who's trained and all of those things. They actually, and we're experiencing this now. I think Tim the. Uh, the uh, link that you shared in our Slack group about the company that that chose a, a four day work week in order to attract new employees and how many new resumes they had in the first day. To ten, ten new CVs in 23 hours. Yeah. yeah. Right. People are caring more about their work environment. They care more about um, work life balance and all these other things. And and that's what startups have known for a while is that if we take care of people, we're going to attract good talent. Yeah, oh, I love that. I love that. I love that. Higher, higher performance. performance. Because startups place more emphasis on one of the most abused words in modern commercial society, which is team. Mm -hmm. We stick a bunch of people on a floor and we go, hey, you guys are a yeah. team now. Go, go solve some problems and start delivering. And the fun fundamental fissure and crack in that methodology of saying, you guys are now a team. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Without thinking about, I mean, I mean, we we don't have. We've only got a couple of minutes left. We could devote four hours to the discussion mm -hmm. about what team dynamics are and what they, how they affect and mm -hmm. make or break and all of that. And the startups put more emphasis on. They need that team to Absolutely. be high performing and not yeah. simply saying, well, they're in a storm and form and norm and performing kind of cycle. You know, that's so right. ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. 
But when we're uh, coming back to what we talk about on, you know, all the time is when you're saying that you want to pull down silos in organizations and get the functions working together, what you're that cross functional ca- uh, collaboration, that's teamwork. That's getting marketing and sales and the product team working together to identify new markets, to um, sell and to develop new pro- products. I mean, that's the holy grail. If you can get your organization, your senior leadership working together in that way, we talk Different about it all the time with social selling. Yeah. You get that senior leadership working together, social across the organization, you're going to see your your outcomes change. Tim, Tim, could you put up Jamie's last quote there? Yeah. So I love that, but it, it, works, it works on a broken principle. It works on a principle that we're already good. <laughs> well, it, it the works on the principle that we're already the, good. The other so, thing about yeah. the book, good to great, is none of the companies exist anymore. <laughs> right, but the fact is, the fact is, getting to getting to good and getting to, is part of being a team. It's that fa- failing and practicing, and maybe mm-hmm. it's a horrible thing to say. Maybe replacing some of the members for the benefit of the greater good, and getting that team all functioning, firing to become good, and then we can focus on being great and world class and fantastic world leaders and all of that. Let's get good first. Yeah, well, here's what I love about Good to Great as a book right now. It served me really, really well in the 90s and early 2000s. And to to Tim's point, um, that era has come and gone and exemplified by those companies have come and gone, right? That era is gone. What we did in that era to be successful has come and gone. Yeah. And uh, just bringing this full circle, what we talked about is what should marketers do in 2022 and beyond in the rest of the 20s? Well, you can't look backwards. You can't look at that. Do, do, and your, hold on do, with your, iron thing, fist. do your thing, Brandon. Yep. I mean, that's that's my job. I, I really believe and I tell people all the time, this is my job between your sales, your marketing and your leadership. And it is. That's it, because you're so focused here that you're missing all these opportunities that are just off to your peripheral. And, and on the subject of books, there is that great book, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Yeah. Right. And I think that the, the, the basic premise of that is a really interesting one. That right. Just because yeah. you're, you're, the, the methodology and the behaviours have got you to where you currently are, that doesn't mean they're necessarily well suited to get you where you, you want to be next. So maybe there's some credit to Zuck for taking, uh, saying, hey, we need to go way out. We've come We're going to rebrand the company and, and look that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've we come, we come full circle. There yeah, you go. And, and I know well, we're supposed done. to wrap up, but I have, I have a lot of grace for Mark and what he's done because he did what he had to do to try and get there. And in a lot of corporations do that with all the pressure and everything. And, and yeah, maybe there is a little bit of a pick up the head and go, how do we fix what mm-hmm. we've, where we it's, made mistakes. Isn't it funny that the, the beginning of this hour, it was Zuckerberg, this and Zuckerberg that, and now all of a sudden it's Mark and Zuck. Z Meister. Yeah. You know, he, he messages me every day to remind me all my friends' birthdays that are happening that day. So I feel very connected to it's him. So nice he's a good, he's yeah. a good lad. All right. Hello. Hello, Brandon. It is Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not even a recording. That's him. Yeah, exactly. That's a live. Right, exactly. Yeah. Great job. Have a great weekend, great everyone. Job, Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. everybody, for tuning Cheers, in. Guys. Comments. Bye. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Okay.